And then I'm going to press play. And if you want to start to let the phone, Francis, that'd be perfect. Yeah, we'll do. Welcome, folks. We'll get started soon. In the meantime, please open up your chat box, say hello. We'd love to hear where you're joining from. Welcome folks from Toronto, LA, New York, Belgium, Palo Alto, Pennsylvania. Good to have you all here. everyone we are going to get started welcome my name is danielle barnes my pronouns are she and her and i'm the ceo of women talk design and i'm thrilled to have you here today for our event on moderating engaging panels uh, before we get started i'd love for you to share in the chat where are you on your moderation journey? Are you someone who has moderated events or panels before? Are you curious about it? Do you have an upcoming event? Uh, so if you want to drop that in the chat, I'd love to see where folks are coming from as we're entering in on this conversation. I'll give you a minute to do that. Mostly chat moderation, but looking forward to verbal. Thanks, Lenine. Be a panelist from upcoming events, so being there from the other perspective, that's great. Interviewed single speakers, but not panels. Awesome. So feel free to keep adding that. Again, my question, if you just joined us, was where are you in terms of panel moderating? Have you done it before? Are you interested in it? I want to get a sense of where folks are coming in from. I'm really excited about this conversation because we've had a couple of folks in our community ask about it and say, how can I be a better panelist? Or I wanna put on a panel, how can I be a great moderator or host? Um, and that's why we wanted to do this event, to be able to talk more about this, to give you a chance to ask questions about what goes into being a great moderator. So I'm very thrilled to introduce our speaker. From working on the World Cup press operations team to producing TEDx events around the world, if there is a large, complex event with a thousand moving parts, you better bet Carol will be there in the center of all directing traffic. No matter, no wonder she's so darn talented at moderating panels. In addition to running events, Kara has a background in both the private and public sector, including director of experience design on the Cancer Moonshot for the then Vice President Biden in 2016 and Senior Advisor in the Biden-Harris White House. She is currently the Chief of Staff for the Intuit QuickBooks platform. Prior, she was appointed to the first class of Presidential Innovation Fellows, served on the data and technology team for the Governor of California's COVID Task Force in 2020, was the Senior Advisor at 18F, TEDx Intuit founder, and worked on the Oscars and the Super Bowl. 
According to her second grade report card, Kara likes to talk a lot. And today we'll learn how relevant that is or isn't when it comes to being a moderator. So please help me welcome Kara. Welcome, Kara. We are so glad to have you here, um, Kara DeFrias. And I want to, the way they want to structure this event, y'all, is I have some questions to get us started, and then we want to hear from you. So about halfway through, I'm going to open it up to q and I'm going to ask you to put questions in the chat, or you can use the raise hand feature, and you can unmute. But to get us started, I have uh, a couple of questions that I'm going to share. And I want you all to know, as I mentioned in her bio, Kara has such an impressive background of moderating uh, panels and hosting events. And she knew the exact song that she wanted to come on to this event with, but the exact second that she wanted to appear on the screen. So Kara has every detail figured out. And I want to start with your story, Kara. Tell us about how you learned everything that you know from moderating successful panels. Thank you. One, for the kind intro. And two, I want to assure everybody present, I don't know everything. I just know a lot from trial and error. Um, and also thank you for the generous, uh, both the invitation and the hard work, Danielle and Francis, you both put into making today happen. I just want to assure everybody, while the bio sounds really impressive, I'm just a kid from Jersey who wanted to be a high school English teacher and coach soccer, but here we are. Um, the, the way, if I think about what kind of goes into, to, knowing what to do and how to do a good panel. So my undergrad, I double majored in theater and English. And so when I was in high school, you know, all of us seniors in uh, our advanced English class, we had to write graduation speeches. And I wrote a gorgeous graduation speech that you also had to deliver. And then they pick one of you to actually give it a graduation. I delivered mine in 38 seconds. So I used to be a terrible public speaker. And what really unlocked everything in my late teens and in college was theater. I found my voice at a small black box theater in the middle of central Pennsylvania at a liberal arts college. And it just kind of took off from there. And I learned how to have presence and how to have vocal variety and how to project. And then the way I kept those skills current as an adult is I joined Toastmasters. And so you're always either giving a prepared speech or you're speaking on your toes, or you're acting as the MC, the host of the Toastmaster meetings. So I found that was a good way to keep me going. Um, I played sports, so I, I learned how to be a team player and I was always kind of in the positions of directing, right? I was the goalkeeper, I was the catcher, I was the point guard um, for soccer and basketball and softball. So, you know, I think everybody on this call and anybody who's watching this video, you have experiences that you can draw from that make you a good moderator, that make you a good panelist, that make you a good producer. Fantastic. And I know a lot of what you shared too, it sounds like it affected your public speaking. And I know that you've coached over like 500 speakers. Um, so lots to share there. And I'm curious, what is the role specifically of the moderator outside of the speaker? How is it different than being on yeah. the panel or being the one that's the host? Yeah, that's a great question. So the job of the, the job of the moderator, bleh, the job of the moderator, uh, one is to be able to stumble over everything like I just did and not apologize for it. So just kind of keep going, pick yourself up, dust yourself off, keep moving on. Um, I'm going to try to make this not too meta today that I'm on a panel talking about Ooh, panels nice. and telling you how to do a good panel. It feels very meta. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, I'm sorry, repeat the question now. I'm just laughing at myself. No, that's okay. And I will say that I thought about this going into it. I'm like, oh no, I'm talking to Kara about moderating and I'm moderating. So this is a lot of pressure. <laughs> You're doing great. Keep it up. Well, uh, but one of the things Danielle did was she sent me the questions ahead of time, right? And so that was great. I'm not going to write them all down. And I actually didn't write my answers down, but it was like, it was a good show of respect because if there's any questions I didn't want to answer, I could strike them. Or if there's any ones that I was like, hey, could we reword it this way? Even my intro, right? So when you're doing a panel, make sure you send your intro to your panelists so they can sign off on it because they might want something accented a little more. They might want something toned down. They might want things set a little differently. So a lot of this happens beforehand. And, and Danielle, you did a great job of, of sending things over and making it easy for me. But please repeat the question because yes. I forgot it already. Yeah, no worries. So what's the role of a moderator, especially uh, versus speaker? Moderator. Yeah, you're really like, we can go sports. You're the referee. You're the umpire. We can go school. You're like the principal. You know, your job is to make sure the objectives you set for the panel. So you want to set objectives for how do you want the audience to feel after they've been on your panel or watched your panel? Um, how do you how do you want them to feel? What do you want them to say? 
And then what do you want them to do? And so all those questions should ladder up to one of those three things better if it ladders up to two or three of them. Um, you know, one of the things I just had a faux pas when I introduced myself, I didn't say my pronouns are she, her, it is in my zoom. Now that we're in this virtual world for the past few years, you know, go into your zoom preferences, have your panelists and yourself, put your pronouns in your name. If you don't know how to do that, you can Google it quickly. Um, but your job is to keep things moving. You know, we'll take it out of sports and school. And let's just go to like, you're the train conductor, right? You have to make sure that train runs on time. It gets where it's supposed to get to. And that really people enjoy themselves, both the audience and the panelists on the way there. And we'll get a little more into the kind of the tips and tricks. But um, yeah, ring a leader, umpire, principal, uh, referee, train conductor, one of those. But your job is to get to the destination in a way that doesn't suck for everybody. Awesome. That's great. Um, so yeah, I want to start to get into some of the logistics. And, you know, I think one of the differences that might come up if you are a moderator is if you're organizing the event versus not. So sometimes you might be also the host of the event or the person putting it on versus you're speaking at a conference and you're a panel as part of this larger event that's happening and you're just moderating that. Um, so I'm curious if you are not organizing the event, let's say you're speaking at a team off site or a conference and you're moderating the panel but you didn't put on the whole event what are some questions that you should ask the event organizer to make sure that you yes. can play that role successfully yeah so one of one of the bigger ones i did was a lean startup conference years and years ago and that's not my show i do know the organizers because i was at into it at the time i'm back at into it again we were a sponsor but whether or not you have a personal relationship with the people putting it on, it's absolutely something you should ask. And so the things I tend to ask are, what's the stage set up like? What are the options for seats? Do you want 16 by nine or do you want four by three for the, you know, if there's going to be a video, I'm sorry, a slide deck behind you. Now, what I usually do for the slide deck is it's super simple. It's the pictures, the titles, the name of the, um, uh, the panel. Uh, I don't get too precious on whether we have to use the conference's pre-approved deck or not. If it's terrible, you don't have to use it. They want you to, but spoiler alert, you don't have to all the time. So just make sure it's a, a really crisp, clear picture of yourself and your panelists. Even better if you actually seat them in the order. So when the slides above them, like they line up with their names, um, have their Twitter handle, have their title, have their organization. And again, that goes back to you communicating with your panelists. What do you want your title to be, right? Because sometimes I use the title Obama White House Director of Experience Design. Sometimes I use Chief of Staff into a QuickBooks platform. It just depends on what the event is. So you always want to make sure you're over communicating with your panelists to make sure you're representing them in a way that they feel best. And, you know, one of your big jobs after train conductor is your job is to help them shine. So everything we're going to talk about today, team, is about how are you helping them shine? And so, yeah, find out what your screen is like, find out what your stage setup is like, find out how they're going to mic you. So Madonna mic is that mic that kind of comes like this. The lavalier is the one that pins on you. Sometimes they'll have a handheld. And so you're going to want to make sure, you know, sometimes they'll want you as the moderator to stand at the lectern and then the seats will be a far away. I don't prefer that. I think it sets up a weird power dynamic. Um, you're also going to want to find out what time of day you're going on because you need all that information so then you can create a doc for your panelists to say, here's what time I need you to get to the venue. Here's what time we're going to get mic'd up. Here's where the green room is. You always want to give, you know, I try to get my panelists there about a half hour before just because one, that gives you buffer for when they hit traffic or get lost or can't find the green room. So finding out all those kind of logistical information will help the day of go way smoother. Great. And I'm curious if you're organizing an event, are there additional factors that you need to consider to make sure that you're setting up your panel for success? When you're actually the event organizer? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think like a lot of logistics stuff came to mind. Um, I mean, if you wanted to get fancy, you can give them tips on what not to wear, you know, stripes and patterns are really bad. Um, you know, think about as the event organizer, what is the topic? What does the safe field do? Those three things I, you know, you should come up with the objectives for, for the panel. Think about who's coming before them. Think about who's coming after them. Be really intentional. If it's a heavy topic, you probably don't want to put it after lunch, right? Because everyone's going to be sleepy. So think about the day parts. So like, you know, on the Oscars and Emmys, it's like, 
there's the day parts and, and the Emmys, even though it's like a technically a three hour show always goes four and a half, you know, you've got your different parts of the show. So act one through act 13. And so just think about where you're placing them, because if you are organizing the event, you have the power to put people in places. And even when I did the lead startup, you know, they wanted me to be in a breakout down the street from the main venue. And I was like, I'm bringing in the CTO of the VA, the, the CEO of human utility, two former White House people, like we're not, we're not doing a breakout room. And we're, and that's another thing is like, is your panel going to be counter-programmed? Or are you, you know, a lot of times when you go to conferences, there's the main stage and sometimes they'll have main stage while they're having breakouts going, or they'll have main stage as a solo event that all attendees come together to. Then they'll have breakout rooms where at another part of the day part where you're all counter-programmed against each other. And so don't be afraid if you have high profile people to say, no, I, I want to be on the main stage and I don't want to be on the main stage in a part of the day where there's counter programming happening. And I do that right now for my, you know, leader, my boss at Intuit, where I'll ask those questions when she's asked to do a fireside chat or a panel, you know, look and see who are you putting on stage together? Are they comparable in title and experience and responsibility, not because anyone is more fancy than anybody else. It's more you want to make sure they can have a rich discussion with each other and talk the same language. Awesome. Lots of, of good information there. And I see some questions that are coming in the chat. I'm going to take some of those as we go, as they're relevant, and the rest I'll save till the end when we do Q&A. So if I skip your questions for now, I promise I will get back to it. Um, but as a follow-up to that, we have a question from Vatsala who asked, what if it's a Zoom event? So I know you talked about a lot of the logistics of questions that you should ask for the organizer if you're meeting in person or considerations. How does that change when we go online? Yeah. That's a great question. So what I did for myself today, so Danielle and Francis were very kind. They sent me a calendar invite that started at 8.55 a.m. Pacific time so that I could log in early. We could check out the video and the audio, ask any last minute questions. What I do when I put on events virtually is I send the invite for the time that, you know, it is, you know, like let's say 9 to 10 a.m. Pacific today. Then I also send them a blocked calendar invite for a half hour before and tell them, please join at today, I would have said 845. And then I also blocked a half hour after. Also recommend I grabbed a room today here at Intuit. Well, I blocked the room from 845 to 1030, just because if there's people waiting to come inside the room right at 10 o'clock or 10 o'clock meeting, that would be awkward with all of you and I'd be awkward for them and be awkward for everybody. So for virtual events, make sure you're getting them there 15 minutes early on the invite. Um, make sure you have a specific speaker URL if you can versus just the general public one. Sometimes like it's a little tricky. It's not the end of the world if you don't do that. Like this is just like, like it's like good, better, best, right? Like good, you have the invite on the calendar for the time that the event is happening. Better, you have a half hour or 15 minutes book before on their calendar, half hour, 15 minutes after just for overflow. Also for your general like hugs and high fives at the end because when they kick everybody out of the meeting, you wanna make sure you shower love on the speaker. Um, not that I'm saying expect that Danielle, I'm just, letting you know. Um, so those are some of the virtual things I would say. Um, you know, if you have like a few tips to send the speakers ahead of time in a virtual one, make sure it's a well-lit room. I tried to get one with natural light. Didn't happen because I did it an hour ago. Uh, but your job is to think of the things the speakers won't. And, you know, again, like if you can get the pronouns in the title, fantastic. Um, what else for virtual? I think that's a pretty good starting place. Cool. Yeah. And I think some of the things will come up to as the questions continue. Um, I know that you have, have, have lots of good tips to share. Uh, you started talking a little bit about speaker selection. You talked about, you know, when when you're kind of helping making sure um, you're the, the leader on your team, you know, has good people that are kind of alongside her. In not all cases, you'll have the opportunity to select speakers. I know sometimes someone's asked to be a, a moderator when there's ready speakers in place, but if you are able to select your speakers for your panel, what are some things that you should consider when choosing those people? I'm a big believer in asking people. So if I needed some, if I needed a cybersecurity expert, I'd reach out to some of my friends who I know in cybersecurity and say, hey, you know, who do you recommend or who would be good? Or, you know, I, when I was a TEDx executive producer, just as a general rule, I was, I started in TEDx back when it started in 2010. The first one was TEDx USC, and I'm good friends with now with the organizer there, um, Ian Murphy. As a general rule, TEDx producers, we avoid people who self-nominate for TED Talks. Um, there are people who, you know, tend to, um, 
it's not quite the stories we want to tell. Um, we want to find those people who have nuggets. So when I'm selecting speakers for my, when I used to for my TEDx events, I would look beyond the norm. So I'd look in academia. I would look at the local newspapers and see who who are the people that are experts in X and then reach out and talk to them. We found some great people. We talked to um, Greg, who's the head of Stone Brewery. We brought him in. He had a great story to tell about why they never did advertising for Stone Beer. And no one had ever asked him for a story before. So find those people, especially because TEDx's are so hyper-local, find those people. If you're putting on a conference about dog shows, like look beyond the norm. Like, yeah, you know, you want to have experts and sometimes that's the right panel to assemble. I find there's so much more joy when you find those people who are just under the surface and haven't had their story told. So for example, with TEDx Intuit, my theme was always art of reinvention. And I reached out to the head of comms at Comic-Con HQ. And he had the coolest story about being a nerd as a kid and never feeling like he fit in. And now he's the head of marketing and communications for the biggest comic convention in the world. And so find those people. And like, you know, like I said, we have here, we have San Diego Magazine. I would scour through every month and see like, who are the people being interviewed? What are the stories they're telling? Um, and then I would invite them to, to speak or be on panels. And it was just so much fun. I love this idea of thinking about the people you wouldn't normally think about and maybe someone who has a slightly different background than, you know, what the title of the panel is. I'm curious how you think about matching up panelists. So as you're thinking about the dynamic of the panel, which we're going to talk a little bit more about, I know there are some questions about, you know, if people talk over each other or if people, you know, debate, but I'm curious how you think about that makeup of who's actually there. If you're, you know, is there an ideal number of panelists and then how do you yeah. think about uh, their dynamic. Yeah. And I'm going to use panel and fireside chat interchangeably. So when Danielle asked if I could give a talk on this, I'm like, I could totally give a talk. I think it'd be way more fun if it was a fireside chat. So that's another thing you have in your arsenal is it doesn't have to be a panel with five people. It can be a fireside chat. Um, you know, there, you really want to make the speakers comfortable. So, you know, sometimes if you ask somebody to come give a talk at your organization or company, they might be like, oh, that's a lot of work. And you're like, well, what about a fireside chat? We'll send you the questions ahead of time. It's going to be totally fun. You're more likely to get, to get a yes in those scenarios. Now, sometimes you have speakers who have canned talks and they're just, they're super ready to go. Um, as far as like the topics and the people you put on the panel, I have a rule that like, I will never appear on the panel. That's all pale males and me. I will never put together a panel that is all pale males. And in fact, I've started coaching over the years because my, my friends who are uh, pale and male have come to me and said like, well, what can we do to be allies? How can we be helpful? And so I have this little template that I send them that says, you know, thank you for inviting me. I noticed everybody else on the panel is a white man. Here's some people I'd like to recommend in my place who are just as qualified as me in the topic you're asking me to speak about. And so we always shoot to have as much diversity on stage as possible. And when I executive produced QuickBooks Connect, which was the first major conference Intuit ever did, our goal was to have diversity on stage that reflected the ecosystem of our customers and partners that we deal with. And we had less than 40% uh, white men on stage and on panels at that first conference, which for a first go out is huge, right? We had to build the trust of the audience and our stakeholders of the company. And it's just, it is hard work, but you just do it. You reach out and you find the people. There is Women Talk Design. If you're looking for women to put on stage, there's a plenty of groups that have databases of people who are very, very good at what they do. And you can get their voices on stage. You have the power as the moderator in many cases to say, this is who I'm bringing with me. I have never had anybody come back and say, oh no, that's a too diverse panel. So, you know, you've got leverage. They've asked you to moderate. You're a big deal. Like act like it and act as if and put to, do the hard work of putting together that panel that reflects the topic in a way that you would feel proud of. Great. Thanks, Kara. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you introduce speakers and that you want to, you craft their introduction. You want to share it with them to make sure you're representing them uh, well. And one of the things that stood out to me is, you know, I think a lot of speakers think about, oh, I have to give people my bio. Like I'm going to give them my bio in order to, to read it. But you mentioned, you know, the moderator would share how they're going to introduce them. And I'm curious why that's important to you to have the moderator introduce the speakers and to really think of that introduction. 
Uh, yeah, there's a couple of reasons. Thanks for asking. One is it just makes for a smoother segue. Two is every single panel I've ever observed, when you ask somebody to introduce themselves, if they only have two minutes to give an answer, they're going to spend a minute and 46 seconds telling you who they are. And it's not for any other reason than it just, you kind of want to fill the space and you want to make sure, you know, people know who you are, but you're, you're actually stealing time away from the good part, which is the content. Right. And so what I do is I, I make sure that whenever I'm throwing the first question out, so I don't get up on stage and say, and here's our five panelists, panelist A is so-and-so from such and such. Like, I don't, I just bring them out on stage. I introduce the panel and then I say, all right, let's jump into questions or whatever my, my segue is. And I'll say, Danielle, you're the head and CEO of Women Talk Design and you've A, B, and C in your career. How do you, and then ask a question that's relevant. I ask a question that's relevant to whatever the topic of our panel is. It takes 15 seconds instead of a minute and 45. And so that's why it's really uh, important to make sure you're crisp with this panelists on like, here's how I'm gonna introduce you. Are you cool with it? Did I miss anything? I like that. So for each question, do you always call on the people or do you sometimes put a question out there and just kind of see who answers? It's a great question. So there's two ways I do it. One, there's a reason you've asked some of these people onto your panel or into the fireside chat. And so there's some, I'm like, you know, again, I'll create the doc, the, the panel brief ahead of time. And I'll say like, here's the order I'm going in. Here's the questions I'd like to throw to you, each of you. And then I'll always have a bucket at the bottom. And I'll say to them when I send the brief out, does anybody want one of these in particular? And then sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. They're like, I don't care. Uh, but the, the, the golden rule of panel 101, moderating 101, is don't ever, ever, ever ask the same question of all your panelists. That is boring. That is dry. That is the quickest ticket to Snoozeville. It is, they're just, it's terrible. Like, that's all I've got to say about it. It is terrible. Please don't do that the end. <laughs> That's great. That's great. I see some people like taking notes. It's like, okay, it's good to know. Um, and I want to talk more about kind of like that actual moderating part when you're live in the panel. Um, that's a great piece of advice that you just shared. And I know that this is a question we talked about and I saw it in the chat too. How do you help moderate the conversation, especially when someone is maybe taking up too much space or you feel like they're not taking up enough space. Yeah. How do you, I think that's something that's so hard for people is like, I don't want to cut someone off, um, but they keep talking or I don't want to like put someone on the spot, but they're not speaking up. I'd love to hear how you handle that. Yeah. You know, it, this is why getting them together ahead of time, even if it's for a 15 minute zoom call, there's kind of ground rules that I put in place. One is absolutely feel free to talk over one another, but in a respectful way, meaning if somebody answers a question and you've got a yes and, which is a term from the improv world of, oh, I agree with you and let me add my experience. I want them to have that. So the vibe, this is again, going back to your, your panel brief, the vibe I always tell people, unless it's a very serious conference and even then I don't care. Um, I tell people we, the vibe we are going for as a panelist's group and as me as moderator is old friends catching up in a coffee shop, right? And so old friends catching up in a coffee shop, they will jump on each other and add to each other's answers and yes, and the heck out of it. And it just creates something where you actually feel like these people know each other, even if they've only met in person for the first time or on Zoom the day of the panel. Now, when you've got somebody, you know, and, and the other thing is by setting up kind of those ground rules ahead of time, they know what you're going to do. And so I've seen panels where somebody's gone way over their time because I, I, you know, some panels, it's like everybody has two minutes to answer. And I've seen some where it's just more, you know, you've got 30 minutes, do your thing. Um, if somebody's dominating, though, the thing you can do, and this is a, I've used this as an MC, I've used this as a moderator. You can just say very simply and very respectfully, you know what? Lainey, we could listen to you talk all day. I would love to hear what Shanna has to say about this, right? And I've done that. And, you know, again, by telling them ahead of time that this is what you're going to do, they're not caught off guard in the moment. They don't feel disrespected, right? At that point, they're probably going to be like, okay, yeah, I was going long. Sorry. Yeah, that's great. So do you always do a pre, I know you mentioned this, a pre-panel meeting, you try to bring people together. And have you ever been in a position where you couldn't? And what did you maybe yeah, do instead for that? I, I, yeah, you know, sometimes people just don't have the time. So that's why I want to make sure they get there a half hour early so that we're having it in that moment. And and even if we've done the pre-video chat, because um, it's always a video chat, even pre-pandemic, mm -hmm. you know, having them in person, just going over your ground rules, like, 
here's how we're going to get introduced. Anybody have any last minute questions? Here's how I'm going to cut you off. If I think you're going too long, like don't make it awkward. It's just, here's how we're running the panel, right? This is how we're doing our thing. And, you know, I've never been yelled at in 20 years of doing this. Um, people just know like, okay, like they might not be happy that like they were, oh, I was just about to get to the great part of the story. I'm like, well, we can totally come back to it. Let's let, you know, get to this first. Yeah. Great. Uh, Monsi had a follow-up question. Are you able to cut them off that way virtually? I feel like it's harder on Zoom to maybe like find oh, that I pause mean, or how you do that. You know, it's funny. I worked on the Oscars a very long time ago and, you know, every year you watch it and you know, I still see some of the names and the credits of people I worked with back then. I still don't understand why they say like, you've got the power in the control room to literally cut off somebody's mic if they're going too long or if they say something inappropriate. And I'm just like, why don't we just do that? And I'm not talking about the people like who actually are having a genuine moment and, you know, the band starts playing. If it's ever inappropriate, you can mute them, right? If they, if they say something inappropriate, like I, I think we've all been in meetings or watched panels or something where so you're just like, mm, that's not something that should be said out loud. And, you know, you can always mute them. That's very extreme. That's like a total edge case. I think, you know, cutting them off virtually, it's, it's, you know, right now, and again, we're getting meta about a panel I'm on or a you know, fireside chat I'm in right now. I have the spotlight or Daniel has the spotlight on me. A lot of times I prefer to have the, the speaker and the moderator both visible on screen, but you know, the, it, it kind of gets into one of the tricks of moderating, especially in a virtual world, which is, and this is actually really a virtual only trick. So bonus points for whoever asked about that earlier is I always have a back channel, private channel set up in Slack. And so we're all talking in there and the panel, especially if it's a you know, multi-person panel, they know to look in that during it. And I'll say like, hey, cut this, you know, cut this short or, hey, you know what, Marina, I'm actually going to throw to you next, not Danielle. And so having and that that's more for your your production team in the background to have that private Slack channel going or whatever your, you know, DMs of choice are. But it is for the speakers as well, so that you can let them know, hey, we're going to skip this question because this other one went long. And that's really the point of having the planning doc isn't just leading up to the day of the event. It's actually your tool at the event so that you can look at the time and you're like, you know, what? we're not going to get to these five questions. So I'm going to skip these four. I'm going to go to the fifth one to wrap us up because we have a, you know, you might have a standard wrap up question that you use. I usually use it something like, what's one thing? you want. And that is, that's the only time I will break my rule of asking everybody the same question. And, but I usually don't ask everybody. I'll just throw it out to the, to the group and say, what's the one thing you want the audience to walk away remembering today? And a couple of them will usually jump in and answer. But by having that plan, you know where you need to kind of zig and zag to during the moderation. Yeah, that's great. Um, it's a lot of thinking on your toes. I was thinking that, you know, it might be hard for people who, you know, with multitasking, having to like message someone behind the scenes and kind of listen and, and talk at the same time. It sounds like a lot of different things to juggle. Well, it, it is, but again, I'm a firm believer, and this goes back to being a stage manager, right? To being a producer, when you have the plan in place and you've studied that plan before the event, you know, if something goes sideways, what you need to do to get yourself back on track. And it's, it's rarely just me as the moderator, especially, you know, at, at Intuit, I created mm, two, three years ago at this point, we wanted to, especially during the pandemic, make sure our product manager, some on the platform and product team, we wanted to make sure that our, our project product managers were getting professional development. Well, how do you do that when you're not in the office? And so we created a leadership salon series, which was a little bit of a throwback to my TEDx Intuit days. And, you know, we laddered it up to the Intuit leadership values. And we made sure that each speaker's, you know, whatever their topic was, it laddered up. And every three months we'd switch to a new value. And what we would do during those is I had somebody who kind of acted as the stage manager while I was doing the on-screen interviewing. So it does take a village if you're going to do, especially like an online series of multiple panels or multiple fireside chats, you know, making sure there's a tech team if you've got availability of that um, or somebody whose job it is to, you know, I would never be the person reading the chat while I'm moderating. Like, for example, Francis would be, you know, DM you saying, hey, there's a question there. Make sure you get to it or, oh, skip to that. That's actually a great moderating trick. So in addition to the private channel for the, you know, production team and speakers, I would have another just DM going with the person who was my quote unquote stage manager. 
And he would feed me the channels as they were coming in. So I didn't have to look at the chat. And then the way that he knew I saw them was I would put that green and white check mark. And I'd be like, yep, I saw it. Now, whether or not I actually asked, it was up to me as the moderator in the moment, but it was me acknowledging to him, got the question. Thanks for letting me know. So to your point, Danielle, you don't have to be everywhere at once mm. while you're moderating, but you've got the team supporting you to help you shine as moderator. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, there was a question about kicking off a panel, which I don't know if we talked about. We talked about introductions, but we didn't really talk about that first kind of question. Um, yeah. I wanted to know if you use an icebreaker question for the whole panel and if that might be an exception of asking everyone the same question or instead do you just kind of dive into your first question? I would ask, uh, what's the reason you think you need an icebreaker, right? Because the way I, the way I run panels is, I, you know, again, the, the planning brief is not only the here's what's ahead of time, but it's the day of. It's got like my intro paragraph. It's got my intro because you've got to remember, you've got two intros. You've got the conference or the organizers who are introducing you in the panel, and then you are introducing the panel and how it's going to run. Right. And so I don't personally feel the need for an icebreaker. If, if you feel like you do, I'd ask why, because it should be everything should be written and designed in a way that you're doing all the legwork and all they have to do is answer your questions. Awesome. Great. And there are some great questions coming in the chat. So if y'all have them, keep them coming. I'm, I'm keeping an eye on those. Um, there's two questions that kind of go together. They might, they might be separate, but I, I did want to ask these. One of them we've talked about before. Um, how much of, as you as a moderator should put your point of view or opinion into what's being said? Um, and the, the kind of question that might go along with this, someone asked if you are not an expert on the topic that you're moderating, like how important is that when you're, do you have to be an expert on the topic in the panel, which I think kind of goes to, should you be sharing your opinion as a moderator? You know, I, I think it comes back to what is your definition of a good moderator? And for me, as a trained conductor, my job is to get us from beginning to an end to make sure the audience is getting good, actionable content out of the answers. and. I think, think of it more than a, rather than an on-off switch, think of it as a dimmer, right? Are there some questions where you believe so wholeheartedly in something that you want to add a tidbit? You should not be though, like if you think about, let's say, you know, every panelist is probably going to take anywhere from 30 seconds to two minutes to answer a question, right? Um, you wouldn't, you wouldn't add any, I'll call it commentary instead of point of view. You wouldn't add any of your personal commentary that's more than probably 15, 30 seconds, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it actually is. So think about why you're jumping in. Is it to show that you're smart? Is it to show that you're getting, you know, you agree with them? Like, because really, if you've got a strong point of view on the topic, you should probably be a panelist um, on it. Your, your focus, again, is to, to be that guide throughout. So personally, I probably wouldn't jump in with my own POV a lot. Now I might say, because I, you know, I tend to know the panelists personally in a lot of situations, and say, oh, you know what, Viv, tell that story about that time, because maybe Eduardo just said something and, and it's similar, you know. So you're really, you're also tying the threads between them. So it's not like ask a question, get an answer, ask a question. You do want to be that that segue. Hey, you know what, Rachel, I really like what you had to say about, you know, Labrador puppies in particular. And, you know, Tim, can you tell me that story about that time you had to deal with like poodle puppies and what a pain in the ass they were? So, you know, you are that, that connective tissue between answers. So it's not just ask a question, get an answer, ask a question, get an answer. It's providing that like that, that connective tissue between answers as your panelists are, are talking about it. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And I love the example of the dog. Yeah, I just, I'm like, what is something that has nothing to do with anything we're talking about? And puppies are awesome. Oh, it was perfect. It was a perfect example. Is there a recommendation that you have of how to wrap up a panel? Always have your wrap-up question. Always yeah. have your wrap-up question. And make sure you're thanking the panelists. Make sure you're thanking the organization or whoever's sponsoring the event. Make sure you're thanking the people behind the scenes, like, hey, big thanks to the tech crew in the background for all your hard work today. Everyone loves to feel appreciated. So I always try to end the panel with gratitude, appreciation, and then give them either a call to action or let them know where they can go to find more information. Awesome. Great. Um, I want to continue to ask more questions from folks in the chat. And also, if any of you want to 
unmute and ask your question, if you can just use the raise hand tool, it's under the reactions. I'm happy to hear your voice and, and be able to hear from you as well. Uh, before we get into those questions, I want to actually ask about Q&A and handling questions. So I don't know um, if you always invite audience questions into your fireside chat or into your panel and you know how you think about when to do that or not, um, but I'm curious if you have any you shared some of the tips of, um, you know, having someone who can help look at those and share those questions for you yeah. and just wanted to see if you had any kind of overall advice about yeah. whether or not even to include it. So the answer is, as many of us know, in the design world, it depends. So if it's a contentious topic, if it's contentious speakers, if it's a topic where or an audience, like I always make sure in my pre-call with the event organizers to get an audience analysis where are they in their careers? Who are the types of people that come to these things? The, your job at this point during the Q&A, you're still, your job is to help your panelists shine. You're actually, your job at this point is also help protect them. You don't want them to get a question that they're uncomfortable answering. You don't want to be in a point where they're getting into it with an audience member live. I've seen that happen both as an attendee, thankfully not as a moderator in my experience. Um, and so sometimes, again, depending if it's a contentious topic or, you know, I've, um, I've held, I've moderated panels of former White House women who wrote a book called Yes, We Can, or Yes, She Can. And I didn't know, and that was, these women weren't a Democratic White House. So I didn't, you know, if there'd be Republicans or other people who didn't care for that particular president. And so in that situation, I didn't have live Q&A. What I did was, and this was, you know, you can, you can do it virtually, but we were in person. I put index cards and a pen on every chair in the room. And what I did about two thirds of the way through the panel is I had, you know, the, the staff who was helping me. Um, and I had told this, the people, if you have questions as we go along, write them down. If you have any questions you already have that you want to ask, write them down. They were delivered to me about two thirds of the way through. And while people were answering one of the questions I threw them, I was looking through because uh, I rarely will ask a question verbatim, especially because if you do it as with the index card trick or even with this, you know, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm pointing to the chat window. You might see two or three questions that are similar enough that you can combine them in a way that you're not asking the verbatim question, but you're asking the spirit of the question. And then you've got three people you've answered their question at once. Um, I'd probably say half the time it's fine just to do live Q&A. People do enjoy getting up and asking, like, I just got to ask so-and-so a question live. How cool is that? So I think it's just know your audience, know your panel, make sure you're protecting them um, from an awkward situation, potentially. Yeah. You mentioned how you handled this, you know, if a, a panelist says something that maybe is inappropriate, have you encountered a situation where, you know, maybe you didn't think it was going to be controversial and someone asked a question that was inappropriate live and, or even if you haven't, how, how would you suggest people handle that? Yeah, it's a tough one. And it's one of those that like, it comes with experience and you, I, I don't know that I've ever gotten it perfect, but I tried to get it right. And again, in a way that showed respect, both to the panelists, the audience and the organization that was sponsoring I think it's like, you know, I, one of the ways I handle once with us, we're not going to ask, ask that question today, or we're not going to answer that question today. Next. Yeah. It's a great, uh, a great kind of simple response that, that helps move on. We've had a couple questions about being a panelist. Um, so I, I'd love to hear if you have any advice for folks on how to be a great panelist, any tips that they should be thinking about on their end, um, especially if there's you know someone who maybe is a first time panelist or doesn't have a lot of public speaking experience. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, just say yes. The first time you're invited, you know, as long as you're cool with the sponsoring organization and it's something that you think will be, you know, good for you. If they're asking you, it's because they actually think you're good at it. They're not going to ask you because they think you're bad at it. So kind of step up into your truth and your light and your power and be confident in your answers. When you've answered a question, stop. Don't fill in the dead space. Don't try to you know, over explain yourself, like give your answer and, and stop. And then the, the good moderator's job is to you know, connect that tissue to the next question they're going to ask somebody, but you know your topic. So just answer the questions. You're very good at what you do or you wouldn't have been asked. Yeah, great. That's great advice. 
Do you have, do you see any differences between putting on panels or um, fireside chats for the public versus private sector and anything folks should consider? Oh, that's interesting. Also, I'll add to that versus private events versus public ones. Mm -hmm. So I've done private and public sector. I've also, because I was in the first class of presidential innovation fellows, there was this narrative the media wanted to build that Silicon Valley was coming to save government, which is total crap. And those of us, the 18 of us fellows in the first class, like didn't believe it. So that's why one of the first uh, panels that I moderated after leaving the White House was at Lean Startup Conference in SF, San Francisco, where I actually flipped the title to what the private sector can learn from government. Because it's always, all the articles are always like, what the government can learn from the private sector. And I was like, oh yeah? watch this. And it was the most well-attended panel. I was told it was on the main stage and there's so many lessons that can be learned. So that's another thing like we didn't really talk about yet, like come up with a good title for your panels, mm -hmm. something pithy. Like when I, you know, when Danielle and team posted about today on LinkedIn, I quote, I forget, what do we call it on LinkedIn? Quote posting, not quote tweeting. And I just said, Hey, looking forward to talking with the team at Women Talk Design about how to make panels not suck. Like that's what we're doing today. Like, and, and that's pithy and it's catchy and people remember it. Um, I think with government, there's usually a lot more hoops to jump through, like questions, questions get pre-vetted and, you know, they want to know who's on stage and vetting those people and vetting is just the process where you kind of do a quick, like look online and background and make sure there's nothing that inappropriate could potentially come up that would embarrass the government, um, private sector, I don't know, I'm a little bit of light vetting, but you know, I, I do take seriously who I put on stage though and making sure like, I'll look at their social media profiles. What have they posted? What have they said? Um, there's a couple of speakers I've, I did not invite. Um, I didn't reach out and invite because I was like, I don't think they're the right fit. Um, now, private event versus public event is a different thing as, long, as well as recording versus not. And so I've told both as a speaker and a panelist you know, and you have the right to do this and they might uninvite you, but you can say, I would prefer that this not be recorded and shared, or it can be recorded and shared with your private community. You can also very, it's, it's, again, it's not a big deal. You can ask people to say, actually, I would, I would prefer that when you introduce the panel that we ask nobody tweet about this. This is for you today. You know, as a, as a panelist, you can say like, this is for you all today. I prefer that we don't record it. I prefer that it's not shared. I prefer no social media. And I think 99% of the time, I've never had a problem with attendees not respecting those wishes. But again, it's it's a choice you get to make just because someone says, especially if they're not paying you, especially if they're not paying you. I've seen big conferences not pay people and then be like, oh, but we totally get to use your talk and everyone. I'm like, that's not how this works. So just know that you have a lot of choices, both as the moderator and the panelist. That's great. I, I like this idea too of like asking for what you want and need, which I think was a theme of, you know, a couple of things that you shared today. Totally. Yeah. I'm curious, you know, one of the questions I asked beforehand, I, I'd, I'd love to hear, um, I'd love for you to share with everyone else is your your favorite um, event that you kind of hosted or moderated and why, because yeah. I thought you had a great okay. answer there. So just to go back to, before I answer that, just to go kind of ground us in terminology again. So there's panels, right, which is like a moderator and like, you know, two, three, four, five people on stage. There's plenaries, which is just a super duper fancy, you probably went to a fancy school way of saying a panel, right? But it's a plenary, it's a panel. Uh, fireside chats have been around for hundreds of years. It's just, there is an expert in the subject. You're a moderator, you're sitting next to them and you're just having a conversation, which is honestly, fireside chats are one of my favorite forms of a panel. Um, and one of my favorite things to do as a moderator, because in a prior career, I was a journalist. So it's kind of going back to my reporter days where you're just, you're, you're, you're unearthing nuggets of gold for your audience, right? And so those are some of the terms. And then I would also argue, and I was talking to Danielle and Francis about this earlier, is as a moderator, you're also the MC, right? You're the host. And so to answer your question, Danielle, my favorite time I've ever emceed or hosted was TEDx Mid-Atlantic back in 2016. I was living in DC at the time. And my buddy, Dave Troy and Nate Mook, who run TEDx Mid-Atlantic, Dave looked at me and he's like, this was like on tech rehearsal day in DC. And he says, I'm moderating or I'm hosting emceeing both days. I'm a white guy. That's not a great idea. Do you want to do it with me? And I was like, I was supposed to be like stage manager for the event. And I was like, yeah, sure, whatever. And so I got to introduce Chef Jose Andres, who is the, he gave a talk that year. 
He's the head of World Central Kitchen, who you might have heard of them in the Ukraine and in Puerto Rico and here in the States. They galvanize chefs to provide food to people in need when natural disasters or bad things happen. I don't know how else to say that at this point. Um, so I got to introduce him, but the, the way cooler part was my dear friend, Vivian Graubard, who I worked with at the White House at the time, was giving a talk about the immigration process. And that was her big portfolio at the White House. And so she gave a, a TEDx talk on that. And I got to introduce one of my best friends on stage. And she gave the most beautiful talk. And afterwards, I came out, you know, clapped and everything. We kind of did one of those selfies with <laughs> the audience behind us. And, and as a moderator MC, that was one of the coolest opportunities was just to to be doing something I love with somebody I care about so much and watching her shine and making sure as the, the, the MC, I was setting her up properly to give uh, the best talk of her life. Yeah, I love that. And that's something you shared about the role of a moderator in general. It's to help your panelists shine and to be able to do some, that for someone that you really care about. It's really neat. Yeah. Yep. Folks, we have a couple more minutes left. So if you do have any other questions, remember you can drop them in the chat or use the raise hand function. If you asked a question and you feel like it didn't get answered because I missed it, feel free to drop it in there again. Um, we, like I said, have a couple more minutes. I know there was a question, I think this was from Monsi, about um, getting better at creating that connective tissue as a moderator. And you know, do you have any tips for that? I know you talked about the importance of preparing in advance, but as yeah. people are saying these things that maybe you didn't know they were going to say, how do you help with those transitions? Yeah, it's it's really about one of the biggest things you can do well is listen. You might think your job as moderator is to talk. Your job is to listen. Mm -hmm. And so you'll see me, I mean, on paper in front of me right now, but like I've got that that planning brief in front of me and I have it on stage. No shame use post a note, whatever you need to use, but I've got a pen. I'm scribbling furiously throughout the panel because I might want to ask a follow-up question or I have a no, I know I have a question coming in, you know, three questions down that I might want to tweak based on what somebody else says or the way that the person I'm going to ask answered their previous question. So the best thing you can do is listen and be taking notes, adding questions, tweaking questions. It is a very important and probably the most critical skill of like, if we talk about skills for moderators, mm -hmm. your listening skills are critically important. And so because you've come up with the questions ahead of time and you thought about them, and again, you've thought about questions that they will be good at answering, but it, more importantly, that will be actionable content for the audience, because your ultimate goal, if you do all those objectives we talked about, how do I want you to feel? How do I want you to say? What do I want you to do? That goal that ladders above all those objectives is that your audience is walking away with at least one thing from your panel that they can go do immediately that day. Yeah. And so, you know, as you're listening and as you're taking your notes, whether it's on stage or at a desk where we're talking right now, um, you've already done the legwork to, to kind of put those, be that connective tissue. And so in the moment, you're just really tweaking. Yeah. Awesome. And do you have any other tips for other than Toastmasters, what one can do to prepare themselves for being a better moderator, I guess more like practice wise. So you talked about all the tips for preparing um, or even just giving speeches. That was one of the questions. We had. Yeah, that's a great question. One, find somebody at work or a friend to run by, just like literally say your stuff out loud. Another trick for writing your panel questions and for your, you know, your intro that you're going to write, your wrap up, it's one thing to write. It's another thing how it sounds out loud. And the way we read when we're reading written material versus how it sounds when we're saying it, totally different. So once you've done your first pass at your script, quote unquote, um, say it out loud. You're going to catch turns of phrase that when it's written, it looks beautiful. But when you hear it, it just sounds off. So that's that's the really big tip there is once the, the planning brief is done, because there's really two parts, right? They're like, here's the logistics. Be here at this time. I'll meet you there. Also, BT dubs get the cell phone numbers of everybody the day of, because they might have a different number that they use in their everyday life. And on day of, they're going to have a different number. Learn that the hard way 20 years ago. Um, and make sure in the planning doc, if you are going to put cell phones in there, you have the permission from all the panelists to share each other's numbers. Um, but anyway, there's two parts of the planning doc. There's the logistics, then there's your script for the event. Um, and you shouldn't be reading it. So you've practiced it enough that, yeah, you can look at it. That's not a problem. I look at mine all the time. But, you know, you know it well enough that you can look up a lot and, you know, you want to alternate between looking at the panelists, looking at the audience, because you're that person that's connecting those two groups, the audience and the panelists. 
And so just practice, find somebody to run it off of. I pull friends and I'm like, hey, I've got to, you know, do a dry run of my panel with myself who wants to listen. And then just, you know, go through it yourself three or four times. Um, I usually do two, you know, out louds the day of. I'll just like run in the bathroom or go into the green room and just read it out loud. So it's fresh on my tongue. And like the biggest mistake you could make is the first time you're saying it out loud is on the panel. Mm. Yeah, that's really good advice. And a follow-up question to that, Lenine wants to know, with all of this pre-planning, how can you make the panel still feel organic and engaging rather than maybe feeling like it, it feels a little bit more staged because you did all this prep? Yeah, that is a great question. I never let the panelists write out their answers and I never practice with them. So I'm practicing, so I've got myself down, but I don't ever have them write it down ahead of time. And also, again, because you've got that bucket at the end of questions you might throw to anybody, um, they they really, you know, they'll know that it might come to them, but it might not. So, you know, it's really about creating, again, going at what is the vibe you want? Because listen, if you're at a highly technical conference, then you might want something that feels more formal. Um, I'm not saying robotics ever the answer, let me be clear. But um, it really has to, what's laddering up to the vibe. And yeah, don't let the panelists, like they might want to write out their answer to their own, but they're never going to send it to you. And, and you don't want them reading off anything either. Great, awesome. We have a couple more questions we're going to finish up. And then I have a final question that I want to wrap up per, per Kara's advice. Um, Kay so wants to know if you have any really tactical tips for great, being a great panelist. So I know you shared before, you know, say yes. And then yeah. also, yeah. Don't, you know, say your answer and stop there. Um, is there anything yeah. else that yeah. you want to add? I think you just heard like 57 minutes of how to be a good moderator. Take all those tidbits and demand that of a moderator for a panel you're on. Mm -hmm. What questions are you going to ask me ahead of time? Hey, can I see the intro that you're going to say about me? For the people organizing the conference, make sure the moderator uses the bio and the headshot you sent. When do you need my bio? When do you need my headshot? Uh, what time do you need me to be there? So take everything we've talked about and make sure that you as a panelist have that ahead of time. I reached out to Danielle. I said, I'm sure you already have a buyer you're planning to use. I would love to take a look at it before it goes live. She did. I made a super tiny tweak. She's an amazing writer. It was actually a really good intro. I told her I'm going to steal it for the future. So just take, my thing would be like, take everything we've talked about and flip it back to the moderator that you're going to be a panelist on. I love that. There's, unfortunately, y'all, we're not going to be able to get to all these questions because they're great, but I will share Kara's article that she wrote that inspired this um, conversation to begin with in the follow-up and um, Kara's Twitter uh, to be able to stay in touch. Um, one question I, I don't even think that we necessarily have time for it, but if there's like maybe one piece of advice you want to share with us, Kara, it's around payment. Um, I know you mentioned um, getting paid. And so uh, how do you decide when to be, do something for free or when it should be a paid opportunity? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a, it's totally fair to ask up front. Um, if you get invited to a panel or to speak, uh, you know, I have a pretty standard response where I say, thanks for the invite. What's the, what's the speaker budget for the event? That's it. What's the speaker budget for the event? I also have four other questions that I ask that are, um, what is the other, you know, what's the diversity makeup of your speaker lineup? Um, how will this information be shared, blah, 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 blah. But like the, the, the answer to the question is, what's your speaker budget for this event? Awesome. That's great. And then finally, you shared so much advice throughout this. I've been like, <laughs> I've like so many notes that I've taken and I'm going to go back and watch this as well because um, it's just a wealth of knowledge. So I'm so grateful that you shared all of this. And I'm curious in all of this advice, what's your biggest piece of advice for anyone moderating their first panel? Biggest piece of advice is have fun. Have fun. Yeah. It's supposed to be fun. It's not supposed to be painful. Yeah. So with all of this, still have fun while you're doing it and all this work. Kara, thank you so much. This was really, truly incredible. Um, your background is fascinating. All the things that you've been able to do that have helped you kind of get here to this point to be able to share all of this. Um, so many great tidbits. Y'all in the audience were awesome. Thank you for all your questions. They were fantastic. Um, and thanks to Francis for helping behind the scenes. And we will send a follow-up and hope to see you all again soon. Go out there and organize your panels and say yes when someone asks you to speak. Thanks, Kara. Thanks, thanks everyone.